Before we start, if this is your first time to the channel and you would like to learn more about FreeBSD and the journey to a better desktop and server, then please hit subscribe and hit the bell so you don't miss out. Unlike another Unix-like OS, FreeBSD has roots all the way back to the creation of Unix itself. Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie, along with Rod Kennedy, created their own OS which was to become Unix on a DEC PDP-7 at Bell Labs. Fast forward to 1992 and Lynn and William Jollitz both worked to port the 4.3 BSD to the Intel 80386 at the University of California. NetBSD branched off this in 1993, as did FreeBSD a little bit later. NetBSD and FreeBSD, although no longer containing any code directly connected with the original BSD release, are regarded as being true descendants of the original BSD. FreeBSD is a complete operating system, which, again, unlike other Unix-like OSs, contains not just the kernel, but the tools, userland, and even the documentation. Currently, there are over 33,000 packages available that are created and distributed by hundreds of FreeBSD developers and thousands of FreeBSD contributors. Because FreeBSD is used by some of the biggest companies in the world, there is a good chance that you've used it without even knowing. A lot of people will tell you that FreeBSD is a fantastic server OS only, but I will tell you that FreeBSD is a fantastic server OS and a fantastic desktop OS. In fact, I've been using it for such for the past 13 years as a desktop and server, and on this channel advocating it as such for nearly four years. Using a browser of your choice, in this case Firefox, open up your favorite search engine and type FreeBSD. If you are using Google, you will see the results as you do on the screen. You will see the main link to the FreeBSD site with subsections underneath. If you want to go straight to the download section, then you can. We will in this instance go to the main front page of the FreeBSD site just so you can be familiar with its layout. In the middle of the screen, you will see a big yellow box. That's where you click to go to the download section to either 13.0, 12.3 or the 12.2 release, depending on your requirement. Clicking on the 13.0 or the current release, you will see some brief information and advice on the disk images available. And that in the FreeBSD 13 section, there are many different supported platforms from the expected AMD 64 to the more specialized RISC-V. You can choose ISO, virtual machine images, SD card images for machines such as the Raspberry Pi, and importantly, documentation, as we saw earlier, which is part of the complete OS itself. For this video, we will be selecting the AMD64 architecture and installing it to another computer. If you are installing to a virtual machine, choose the image that best suits you or the ISO file that can be used with VirtualBox. We will select the IMG file, the image file, which can be written to an SD card or USB stick. If you require the full suite of software that can be installed without an internet connection, this would require the larger DVD file with DVD in the name. The other choices are the CD-ROM sized images, which are labeled disk one. These are of a similar build to the SD card or USB images, uh, which is a light install that contains the bare minimum in terms of packages and assumes you have a working internet connection. So we'll select the AMD64 memstick file as we are writing to a USB storage device and it's optimized for that, which will bring up the save dialog. Save to the location you want and remember this location as you will need it later when we begin the writing to USB process. Once the download has been completed, change to the folder where it was downloaded or find the folder through the dialog in your app of choice. For Windows users, you can write the image file to the USB stick using Belena Etcher, Win32 Disk Imager or Rufus. For Unix-like operating systems, you can use the DD or Disk Dupe utility to do the work using the syntax you can see on the screen. There are subtle differences between each OS and how to format the command. Mac users can also use Berlin Etcher. In this particular case, we are using a FreeBSD machine to do the writing, so we will be using the FreeBSD command format. Once that is done, remove the USB stick and put it in the computer you want to install on. Making sure we can boot from the USB stick, we'll reboot the machine. 
The speed of the install really does depend on the speed of your hardware, in particular the USB stick, and whether it's USB 1, USB 2, or USB 3. You may experience USB 1 speeds if there's a problem with your virtual box, or USB 2 speeds if you've got an older computer, like I'm using for the test machine, which is an Optiflex 780. On machines with a USB 3 Plus, it will be a quicker experience. A few moments later, you will be greeted with a standard FreeBSD boot menu and a whole lot of menu options. Not to worry, once you learn what these do, because it doesn't change very often, you'll be good to go. 1. Boot into the system normally, which is the default behavior. 2. Boot into a single user or maintenance mode. 3. Allows setting or unsetting of loader variables. 4. Restart the machine. 5. Enables selection of desired graphics device. So if you have a machine with both AMD or NVIDIA, you can choose which one. 6. Select kernel if there's more than one. 7. Change boot options for this boot session only. And 8. This option will appear if you're using a boot environment manager such as BEADM. Pressing enter will boot into the multi-user mode, which happens to be the default. You won't really need to worry about the other options unless your hardware or system requires intervention, either pre or post install. During the boot process, you will see lots of text scrolling up the screen. This is normal, and other operating systems do this as well, but it's often hidden behind splash screens or other graphics. The first menu you will see is the welcome screen, where you will be asked if you want to begin the installation or use the live CD. The latter is not what you may think it is in the traditional sense of live CD. There is no GUI or desktop. Think of it as a rescue option that will take you to a command line environment. To start the install process, press enter or return, depending on what your keyboard shows. We will then be presented with a key map screen. At the top is the option to continue with the default, which is the US keyboard map. And straight underneath is the testing option, just to make sure you've selected the correct key map. In our case, because we're in the United Kingdom, we will have to scroll down. Of course, you choose your own depending on where you are. When you have selected your option, testing is a good idea, although not essential. If you are happy, then select the continue option. Next, we need to set the host name. You can choose an appropriate name here. I tend to call the test machine, well, test. I have a few machines here, so really it's for my benefit. Next is the distribution selection screen, but it isn't the same as a Linux distribution selection. No, this is where we can choose what should be installed into our system. Note that this isn't the user land application, such as LibreOffice, etc., but debugging files, 32-bit libraries and source trees, etc. Because we're installing a desktop oriented FreeBSD-based system, we can unselect the debugging options and keep the 32-bit compatibility libraries just in case we need them down the road. We don't need the ports tree unless we will be installing from ports rather than pre-compiled packages. Next is partitioning. This next bit is down to personal choice, I suppose. If you want total control, then you could and should manually partition your drive. There are tutorials out there that suggest that this should be the way it should be done. I, I disagree. The, the guided options are as suggested by FreeBSD is perfectly okay and if you choose root on ZFS the suggested partitioning scheme is pretty good. The options here are auto ZFS, auto UFS, manual and shell. The first two determine the file system choice, ZFS being relatively new and UFS is extremely stable and well developed. I used to be a great UFS fan and I still am but I've shifted towards ZFS for the backup features you get with it, especially the boot environment managers. I find them to be invaluable. The final two options are a manual partitioning option using a menu and a shell option to partition the system by hand if you so desire. Because we selected guided root on ZFS, we are presented with a ZFS configuration menu, much of which we can leave as default. But that's not to say we should. If there's any options you would like to change, now is the time to do so. Top of the menu is the proceed with installation. Next is the pool type or disk menu, which will allow us to define which disks to use in the pool and which disks are present and should be used. Next is rescan devices and disks info to get the information on any devices already attached to the system. Pool name allows you to customize the Z pool name. You can leave this as default if you want. Next, force care sectors. This can be toggled on or off, but it's advised to leave it on as it aligns partitions to the 4K sector of the hard drive in new and larger hard drives. The next option asks whether we want to encrypt the disks and it would be using Geli to encrypt the data. 
Very useful indeed and handy if using the laptop with FreeBSD and ZFS. Down the list and you will see a partition scheme option. It's suggested to leave it as a default, which is GPT. Swap is the next option to configure. In the default configuration here, it is only two gigabytes, which is not that much in the scheme of things. You can mirror the swap if you want for redundancy. Following that is the option to encrypt your swap. Again, it's a personal choice, but one that is included for added security. Going back up to the pool, type disk entry uh, press it enter will take us to the virtual device type config menu where we can set the type of zfs system we want you can set the stripe for a single hard drive with no redundancy you can still get the benefits of zfs but just not the mirroring and this is fine for most desktop systems that will perhaps only have one hard drive then there is mirror where two or more disks can be connected it provides the best performance but the least storage uh, as essentially you only have access to one drive's capacity so two one terabyte drives will be seen as just one terabyte rather than two terabytes i think that these two options are the best for a workstation or desktop the rest are pretty much server beneficial and specialized to a certain extent so selecting stripe because there is only one single hard drive in the test machine takes us to the select the drive menu where the hard drive is listed at the top of the, and the usb from which we are booting is at the bottom for FreeBSD, most internal drives are labeled ADA0, ADA01, ADA02, etc. And external or USB storage devices are DA0 or DA1 or DA2, etc. So we need to select ADA0 to install the FreeBSD OS. On selecting our choice, we have returned to the previous menu and we just need to select proceed. Before the actual install begins, we are presented with what a last chance to back out of sorts. It will look scary, but really it's there to make sure that you know that the drive will be wiped and written over. And we are off. We'll fast forward this. The next phase involves some input in order to finalize the install. First is the request for an admin or root password, which will allow the installation of software and other system-wide tasks. You will need to remember this and not give it out to other users if you are not the only user of the system. You won't see any asterisks or other signs that you are typing, so you will have to be careful. And this is a good thing in general, as it makes it hard for someone to see how many characters are in your password and possibly guess it. But it also makes it hard just in case you forget what you've typed, or indeed if you haven't typed enough. And this is where the retype your password comes in. If you are sure you have typed it incorrect but made a small error, typing the password as it should be in the second line will flag up that they don't match. Next is the network configuration. You may get different results here, different names for Ethernet devices, maybe some Wi-Fi devices. Select the one you want, in this case the built-in Ethernet, and press Enter. You will next need to configure IPv4 or IPv6. In this install it's IPv4, so we select Yes. And then, do we need to configure DHCP? Well, you can of course, and sometimes that's the easiest route. But for this test machine, I do prefer to go the manual way and select No, which will take us to the manual entry page for the IP address, etc. Put in the values you require, then select OK, then press Enter. Again, if you want to configure IPv6, you can. I don't, so it's a No. The next part is configuring the LAN and the DNS server address you want. All done for you if you chose DHCP, but here it's up to you. Put what's appropriate for your system in the LAN section and the address or addresses you want for the next two. Next is the time config. You can choose UTC or go for the more in-depth setup. Selecting No, we can see the time zone selector and a whole list of available time zones to choose from. Select the region you want, in this case Europe. We can choose another region or country if listed and we'll select United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Confirming the abbreviated time zone, we move on to setting the time and date. And if it all looks correct, you can select skip. Or if there is a problem here, then this is the chance to set it. Moving on, we are now presented with the system configuration menu. And we can choose which services we will have running at boot time. The services are a personal choice and you may need some and other not so much. You can select or unselect these later if you change your mind. You can choose local unbound, a local caching server, SSHD, the secure shell daemon if you want to work into the machine remotely, mouse D for PS2 connected mice, not really needed if you have a USB mouse but it can be enabled if you want. Then there is NTP date and NTPD 
both use to sync your machine to a time server, so you have the correct time. Then we have PowerD, which can be used to adjust the CPU frequency, not so much aimed at desktop users, but laptop users will find it very handy. Then finally, there is dump dev, which will place kernel crash dumps in the var crash folder. Something needed for servers and developers, but perhaps not so much for desktop usage. When you are happy with your selection, then select OK at the bottom of the list. Next, we have the hardening list. And for a desktop system, you can select all these options. Like the last menu, if you are running a server or development machine, then maybe you might want to keep some things like hid underscore jails and disable DD trace enabled. It all depends. Now, perhaps the most essential menus, adding users or users to your desktop system. No users is, makes not for a useful desktop system. So we need to add some and we need to select yes here. Abruptly, the design of the screen changes uh, to something which I wish was more of a uniform design like the earlier cursor style, but it does the job and it sets the look you will get when the system finally installs. First, add a username. It can be a shortened version of your own name or nickname. I use lowercase, but you don't have to. Just remember what you put as you won't be able to log in if you forget it. Then enter your full name and as you can see, use a different case arrangement for your username. Next is user ID. We can leave this as default and it would give you the first user added as 1001. Then there is login group. Again, we can leave it as default and it incorporates the username so it makes sense. Next, we are invited to add the user to some other groups. And here we normally add wheel, operator and video. Login class can be left at default and shell can be set to your own choice. It depends on what you prefer. I personally like the plain born shell. Home directory can be left as default as well, as can home directory permissions. The default yes for password-based authentication is advised, as is no for using an empty password. You don't want a random password, you might forget it. Selecting no will prompt you to enter a password for your user, and again, like the root password entry, it's important that you enter it correctly as you won't see any input on the screen. The next question is, do you want to lock out the account after creation? Uh, no to that, which is then followed by a summary of the entries you have made so far. If you are happy with that, then type yes. Otherwise type no, and we will start the process of adding a user again. If we are happy with the details, then typing yes will bring up that the user has been created, and would we like to add another user? If we do, type yes. If not, then type no. Now we're on the second to final menu, and this is an opportunity to change anything we have entered so far. If all is good, then select exit, which will then apply the configuration and exit the installer. Now, the all but one final menu is a confirmation that the install has been completed. And it asks you, would you like to make any modifications to the terminal by hand? You can drop to a shell if you do, otherwise you can select no, which will take you to the final screen. Here you can choose to reboot and then quickly remove the USB stick um, or change the BIOS so it doesn't boot from USB. Or you could choose the live CD option, which will allow you to enter some commands like shutdown hyphen P now, and then you can remove the USB stick at your leisure. Okay, we'll choose reboot and allow the machine and OS to do their thing. So here we are. Rebooting and the first thing you will see when the initial boot has finished is the FreeBSD boot menu screen we first started with when we began the install. Pressing enter will begin the boot and the usual text will fly up the screen. After a little while, we are presented with the login prompt. It may look sparse and there aren't any thrills when you uh, first install FreeBSD, that's for sure, but that's part of the greatness about it. Enter the name of the user we created earlier and the password you hopefully remembered. And that's it. It may not be snazzy, it may not have the fancy graphics of other operating systems, but it's ours to create and to mould into something that's unique to us. Right, here we are at the login prompt, something that can seem a little off-putting if you're used to seeing a nice and colourful login prompt. Well, we can have that too, and that's what we'll be doing hopefully in this video. Once we have logged in, we can begin. We will first update the system to make sure we are running with the latest bits and pieces, as well as the latest security fixes. So we'll log into root, 
To see what version and to check the current patch level, we will use uname-a, something that all Unix-like users are familiar with. As you can see, we are using FreeBSD 13.0 release, and it is currently at patch set or patch level zero, which is reasonable considering we've just installed it. So the first thing we're going to do is to update the system. And the way we will do that is by using the FreeBSD update tool. It's a great way of checking, downloading, and installing any available patches and updates to the core system. And remember that FreeBSD separates the core system from the user land, something which other OSs don't do. Issuing the command FreeBSD update fetch will pull down any available system updates, but it won't install them until we tell it to do so. After the patches have been downloaded, you can review what's been fetched by pressing space, which will scroll a new page of details. When you want to exit this, press Q and you will be returned to the command line again. Now we must install the updates. And again, we type FreeBSD hyphen update, but this time we will use install at the end rather than fetch. Once the patches have been installed, we need to reboot the system. You can either use reboot or the alternative is shutdown R now. After logging in again, if we issue the command uname A, we will now see that the system is up to patch level or patch set six. Okay, so now that that's done, we need to bootstrap or fetch the latest package list from FreeBSD repos. Typing in PKG update will prompt the system to ask do you want to fetch and install it now? We'll type yes or Y, which will install the PKG tool and bring in the latest list. This test machine is sporting an NVIDIA GeForce 710 GPU. The search results will bring up a good list of available drivers. And if you have a non NVIDIA card, then you'll need to apply that driver more suitable for your card instead of what I will use here. And that applies to a newer driver. If indeed you have a newer card, we will have to install a slightly older driver and not the latest one, which is listed at the top. The one in green is the one that we will install. But if you have a machine with a hybrid graphics, then consider the ones underneath in red. So knowing the driver version we need, we will install the graphics framework and driver first before we configure the system for the desktop. Pressing Y will start the install and we'll configure things a little later when it's finished. If your system requires a driver for an AMD GPU, an i815 or Radeon, then the DRM-FPSD13K mod should be installed. One thing you have to be aware of is that some guides have the package name listed wrong, as you can see, with the incorrect label being DRM-FBSD13.0-K mod, when actually the label is just DRM-FBSD13-K mod. There is no dot zero. Okay, so now we need to make some changes to the rfc.com file. So let's take a look at the install configuration file first. We are looking for any NVIDIA entries, and there isn't any, so we need to insert them using sysrc. Sysrc will add to the file without editing the file directly. And this is safer and will help prevent mangling of this important system file. But it's still not immune to spelling mistakes, so you have to be careful sysrc kld underscore list will place a line in the rc.com file that will load in some kernel modules that will enable xorg to work namely linux and nvidia mods the nvidia hyphen mod set entry is really only needed if the latest nvidia driver is loaded i'll put it in as an example but it's not required on this system and the linux and linux 64 modules are there for the nvidia drivers that have been compiled to use the linux mods if you don't want to have or don't intend to use the Linuxulator or the Linux ABI, then you can compile the NVIDIA package yourself or compile using ports to exclude the need for the Linux ABI. Now, checking the rc.com file again, we can see that the KLD underscore list entry is at the bottom. The NVIDIA and Linux mods will have to be loaded either now or when the system boots to use the NVIDIA drivers. You can check if they're already loaded in by using KLD stat, which will list all that is currently loaded. And looking at this, we can see that there are no Linux or NVIDIA modules loaded. 
We could reboot the system to load them or issue the command KLD load to do it now on the fly. KLD load Linux, Linux 64, NVIDIA and NVIDIA hyphen mode set will result in a message telling us that the NVIDIA driver is loaded and by implication, so is the Linux mod. It also tells us that, as we knew, that the mode set operation is not required. Using chaosstat again, we can see at the bottom, the modules are loaded, so that's looking good. We can proceed to install the desktop environment, and for this video we'll be installing KDE Plasma. It's a very slick and professional desktop that has come a long way over the past few years to reclaim some of its glory it lost when KDE 4 was released. KDE 5, or KDE Plasma, is relatively lightweight for some of its size and is very customizable if you want it to be. Or great to use if you just want to stock install. So, typing pkg install KDE 5 is all the commands that we need to get the ball rolling. Having fast forwarded a lengthy install, we can now start. But first, let's see what happens when we use start x to test the install. Surprisingly, you will be presented with the default window manager for Xorg called TWM, or Tom's Window Manager, as I think it was originally called. It's a great window manager in its own right. It's highly configurable, but it's not what we want right now. So clicking on the largest console window on the left hand side and typing exit will close the window manager down. In order to start KDE via StartX so we can test it, we need to edit or rather create the .xinitrc file, which will then tell the system which desktop and a few other things which we'll cover in another video we want when the graphical interface starts up. Using your editor of choice, I always use EE, which is Easy Editor, edit the .xinitrc and copy the line on the screen. I'll put this in the description box below. Save it and then we'll move on to a bit more before we start the desktop. Something else we'll need to do before we can have the desktop started is that we'll need to have the dbus daemon running and we can check to see if it is, which it shouldn't be, using service dbus status. Now this would normally tell you if it is or isn't but it won't yet as we need to put in another entry into the rc.com file so as before we'll use a sysrc tool. sysrc dbus underscore enable equals yes will place an entry in the file as before, that will allow us to start, stop, restart, and monitor the DBus service. So we have Xorg and KDE installed. We have created the XinitRC entry, and now we have started the DBus service. StarTech should start KDE as desired. Things are looking good, and yes, there is the KDE logo, and it's very nice indeed to see it. And there it is, the vanilla KDE desktop in all its glory. If we have a look at the menu, you will see that all the familiar KDE apps are there, which is good. So now we know it works as intended, and we can install the login manager. And in this case, it's going to be the SDDM, otherwise known as the Simple Desktop Display Manager, which will give us that nice shiny login window we mentioned at the start of the video. We now need to make an addition to the fs tab file so that the Linux ABI and therefore the NVIDIA driver behaves itself. When that's done, we'll restart and it should automatically reboot into the login manager. And there we are. There's a nice shiny login screen that takes on the themes of the KDE desktop we saw earlier. In order to make sure we can log in, we need to make sure that we use the option at the bottom of the screen of a desktop session using X11 and not Wayland, otherwise it won't let us in. So make sure that the correct one is selected and we can enter our password for the user. And then we are in. So that's the desktop installed. We're on our way to have a great desktop and in the next video we'll get down and dirty configuring and installing software so that we can actually use the desktop. KDE comes with almost everything that you want straight away. 
you know, you've got multimedia, office, internet, uh, email, it's all there. But there are a few things that we would like to add, uh, say, for instance, um, Firefox, or some office applications, etc. So we're going to fire up a console. Just move that down a bit so we can see what's going on and zoom in. And we're just going to go to root. If we issue PKG install Firefox, it's as simple as that. The system will then ask, do you want to install and proceed with it? Yes, of course. And it begins to install. And finished. And it's really as simple as that. If you want to install, oh, I don't know, LibreOffice, it's the same procedure. And oh, I've just noticed at the bottom, I actually automatically updated the icon for Firefox, which is pretty cool. And it pulls down everything it needs. I'm just going to speed this up because it is a large install. And there we go. And it recommends that we add these to the FS tab, which we will do right now. So again, if you go into root. So we're going to go to forward slash etc forward slash FS tab. And we'll just copy that what it describes there. We've already got proc already uh, installed from the last video. So we'll just save that. Issue a mount hyphen A for mount all. And there it is. Dev FS and proc already there. Right, once that's done, we can have a look. And there it is, it's all installed. Very nice indeed. A lot of people don't use uh, full office suites anymore. They prefer an online like Google Docs, etc. But you know, I like to have one installed on a computer. It just, uh, I don't always trust the internet for connectivity and sometimes I want to make sure that I can get things out regardless. So there we go, we'll what's save that. And there's that done. Next, we're going to install two essential items I need for video production. That's Inkscape for the thumbnails, etc. And Caden Live, obviously, for the video production. And we'll just uh, go again, fast forward. And close that. It's all done. Now that we've got some of the essentials installed, some useful tweaks which will make the system a bit more usable. So if you do pkg install do as, and edit forward slash user forward slash local forward slash etc and forward slash do as dot conf. And we're going to put these very basic um, entries into it. Permit no pass, so it will uh, allow us to going to root without asking for a password you can obviously change this and so it requests a password every time if you want i'm the only person who's going to be using this computer so it's not a big deal for me and permit no pass so this will allow us to essentially allow us to shut down the computer or reboot etc there are plenty of other um, alternatives that you can use and there's plenty of guides online that can help you with that if you need them Now we're going to edit the bootloader.com and we're going to add some entries that we want the system to uh, do when it first starts. One of them is to cut the amount of time that we're waiting on the main menu, which I think currently is nine seconds and we've got it down to three. Three because then it still gives us time to intercept the menu if we need to make any changes. But three is pretty speedy. So just save that. And if we now edit the syscontrol.conf. Again, if you need this, these are essential if you want some tweaks on the system to be there when it starts. The first entry we're going to make will allow us to mount or unmount external storage devices as normal users. Next is to change the responsiveness uh, from a server to a desktop. And then we're going to disable the system beep. Next, we're going to allow Chromium to uh, access shared memory. And I'm just going to do a little bit here. I What I like to do when I'm making alterations to system control files, I like to just add these pound signs or hash uh, signs just to let you know the entries that I've made. It's 
go back into loader.conf. And I'm going to add something which will change the uh, graphics. So at the top is the default um, orb logo. And we're going to change it to the beastie one at the bottom. For the more traditional list out there. Next, we're going to add the core temperature sensors if you're running Intel processors. If you're running AMD, then it's AMD temp. Now we're going to enable the in-memory file system or temp uh, file. Asynchronous input output. Uh, we're going to enable that. Save that. And if you go into rc.conf, there's a lot of editing going on, but you know, it makes the system more responsive. I'm just going to change that. I made a spelling mistake last time, so I'm going to change that to NVIDIA. Oops, there you go. Luckily, it was on the mode set, which we didn't use, but you always have to be careful like that. Like I said last time, SysRC will not check for bad spelling. Right, we're going to make changes, so uh, they allow the time server to make 1,000 plus second alterations if uh, a clock is wildly out of sync. And to save that... Next is something which I get asked a lot, and that's auto-mounting. And this is Frank's River Maiden as well. It is a fantastic blog, but he also created this fantastic little application which will do the work for us. Right, so we're just going to install auto-mount, and it will pull in a lot of extras. I will go into more detail on this in another video, but for now, we're just going to set up for the bare bones. So we're going to do as, edit, user local, etc. automount.conf. Eventually get there. There we go. And I don't know if there should be some entries in it, but it's blank, so we'll create it from scratch. User mount equals yes. It allows the user to mount it. Access time, no. Um, we'll put this in. I'm not sure whether we need it, but I'm going to put it in regardless. And the file manager we're going to use is Dolphin. You can put whichever one, of course. User is RoboNuggy, or obviously your username. And we're going to put the encoding as English GP. Obviously, change it to your own local settings. And I forgot to put in car set as well, so, but it seems to work without it. Now we're going to set the locale. So if we edit uh, etc forward slash login.conf and scroll down to the bottom there. I just put this little uh, backslash. There we go. And really all we're adding is lang, well, language obviously, equals English GB. Again, put your own uh, local version there. UTF-8. We'll leave it open-ended and come out of it, save it, and issue oh right okay need to issue it properly that's cap underscore make db and then login.conf that's it now we're going to make some changes to x in it rc and i have this in mind and it really does it, it prevents uh local problems i'm just going to speed through this i'll put this in the description box down below so you can copy it if you wish and turn off the automatic screen blanking if you've got it added. Right. But now we're going to reboot the system and test it. Hopefully uh, we haven't made any mess ups and it will reboot properly. Seems to be alright so far. And here we are. Yes, yeah, very nice. Log back in. And yes, nice and clean. I'm just going to try a USB stick. Now, this is formatted with uh, UFS. I couldn't find a Windows one, and I ain't got a Windows machine to use uh, to create one with. So, I, nor have I got a Linux box either. So, uh, I'm just going to put this one in. Yeah, that's nice. A good sign. It's detected it. And let's see if it. Yeah, lovely. That's nice. So, it mounts it automatically and opens a folder for it, which is uh, what we want. It usually keeps the home one there. 
That's a little bit annoying. We'll see if we can alter that. But yes, very good. It uh, it mounts it and opens a little file manager for it, as, as we told it to. Okay. I think we'll make some changes. If we go into console, I'm just going to zoom in there if we can. I think there's an option in Dolphin so we can have it open in a new window. I'm just going to check that. Uh, yeah, double hyphen new window. Okay, so I'm just going to edit the auto mount .conf. I'm just going to go down to that and put that double hyphen new window just so it stops that rather annoying multiple tab thing. If you don't do that, it'll just open every time you open the USB thing, it'll just open it in a new tab, which is not what I want. So save that, and I don't think we have to restart anything. I'll just uh, replug the USB in. Right now, I'll plug it back in, and hopefully, does it? There we go. Yeah. So there's the Windows One FAT32 partition recognized. I'll uh, unplug it again and plug it back in. Yeah. Very nice. So it opens up a new window, and so it's not all cluttered. That's exactly what I want. Mounting NTFS drives is something which I get asked quite a lot. Uh, it's quite understandable, really, considering that many people have them lying around. And following on from the last video when we did some auto-mounting, which was really just for some uh, FAT32 drives, I thought that I would cover NTFS. So I've plugged in a USB stick that's been formatted with NTFS and it doesn't pop up automatically. So having a look at D message, uh, all right, I need to get into uh, do as. And yes, the actual drive has been detected. The thumb drive has been detected. So I'll just clear that. What we're going to do, is we're going to install some Fuse packages. Now Fuse allows you to interact with file systems, etc. That's not native to your system. And we'll do a quick search. There's a few that I want to add on. Fuse NTFS is already installed in this uh, test machine. But if not, then just look at the instructions on the screen. It says Fuse FS X FAT uh, and all the way down to Fuse FS NTFS if you haven't already got it. But because I've already got it installed, the actual number of packages to be installed is smaller. And to be honest, they'll come in useful later on. So once that's been installed, and I'm going to restart the dev. I mean, I don't know if we need to do that, but it's false of habit, really, I suppose. Now we're going to edit the rc.conf and just at the bottom there, I'm going to add fuse underscore enable equal yes. And that will start this, the uh, the fuse when we first start the machine up. Now we're going to go into bootloader.conf. I'm going to add at the bottom of that fuse underscore load equal yes. And that will load the kernel module. I can restart it again. Like again, I don't know if you need to do this, but it's uh, something that I like to do. And most essentially to actually use it now, rather than start the machine, we're just going to load the kernel module now. So fuse, FS, and that should be it. So because the USB is already plugged in, I'm just going to mount it manually. And s yep, it worked. That's fine. Just uh, close that down. Right, so that works. I'm just going to pull out the USB stick and plug it back in and see if it auto mounts. There, yeah, that's fantastic. So it auto-mounted it and opened up the Dolphin file manager as usual, which is very nice on the NTFS drive. And that's it. That's all you need to do. And just have a look at the drive using Gpart. DA0. There you go. There's NTFS active. Very nice indeed. And in case you're wondering, yes, you can actually write to it. So I'm just going to mount it manually again and create a new folder there we go if you can manage to do it there you go so yes perfectly usable read and writable wonderful something else we didn't do last time and this is really to set drive permissions so you can access scanners printers etc so we're going to edit forward slash etc forward slash devfs dot com and scroll all the way down to the bottom again just on that bit yeah and we're first going to add 
this little rem line just to, so we don't forget what it is. And we're going to allow users to access optical media. So there's a lot of people that still use DVDs or even CD-ROMs. There's quite a few to add. So I'm just going to do a few now and then we'll fast forward and finish it off. One thing that is really useful, there is a website called Cool Trainer. It has been updated for a while now, but it's still very much pertinent really what we're doing. And there's a section there covering, there we are, devfs.com. So just basically copy all that. There's some bits at the bottom we're going to trim off and paste it in. Saves you from typing it all out. There's no point in doing that if you, if you can get around it. We're just going to delete these. These are for TV adapters. Now, if you've got a TV adapter and you want to use it, then keep these. If not, you might as well just get rid of it. And there we go. So the scanner permissions and external drive, etc. So I'm just going to clear that. And the next bit we're going to do is going to edit the DevFS rules. This goes hand in hand, really, with what we've just done. There's nothing in this file, so we're going to have to create it from scratch. So DevFS rules underscore common equals seven. It doesn't matter what you really call it, as long as each rule set has a unique name and number. So the next bit, we're going to add path. This really defines what we're looking out for, what we want the system to look out for. In this case, ADA. So, you know, we're looking out for internal drives from numbers from 0 to 9. It means it can be mounted and... Same for external drives and CDs and cards and all lovely things like USBs. So again, like before, we're just going to copy this and paste it in. Just tidy up a bit and there we go. Just delete the ones we don't want and there we go. And everything looks, uh, everything looks good. This allows us to access the various things we want to plug in. Next, we're going to edit rc.conf and we're going to add that rule set that we defined. There we go. DevFS underscore system underscore rule set and the name of the rule set we used. Next, we're going to do a simple firewall using IPFW. And this is one which has worked for me uh, very well, so I'm, I'm just going to use this one. So we go to rc.conf, we go to the bottom, and we add firewall underscore enable yes. So it does when uh, the system starts up. Next is firewall underscore quiet. So really, we don't want uh, lots of text scrolling on the screen, unless you do, of course, in which case, but no. And this one, because we're using a desktop, it's going to use workstation. Because if you're using a server or you might want an alternative or use a different type of firewall. Firewall underscore my services are what you want to be able to access uh, on your machine. So if you want to SSH in or out or web, etc., email, then you need to put them there. Firewall underscore allow services. We'll put that to any. Uh, log deny. You don't have to use exact ones, of course. You can, uh, and I actually fully recommend that you look up the different options available once to suit your own machine. But these ones will get you will get you set up nicely. I'll leave a copy of this uh, firewall rule set in the description box down below. And we'll start the firewall now using service IP FW one start. You won't need to do that again if you start the machine up. It does because uh, we need to get it going now. I'll use that. And there we go. Firewall rules loaded. We're just going to change the package repository to the latest. Now, when you install FreeBSD, it will automatically come with really the system pointing at quarterly rather than latest. The difference being is quarterly usually is three months behind. So every three months, you know, it will update them a lot. And by that time, the latest ones have moved on a little bit further. So obviously the latest is meant to be the latest software. And, and so if you follow that particular PKG, uh, that package tree, you will have to update more or you'll find more updates available. But quarterly is meant to be more stable and therefore not updated as much. It's not really out of date software, but it's, like I say, about three months behind. Now, if you're using a production machine or you don't mind this, 
then fine, just, just leave it at the default. So what we do in this part is that I'll show you how to update the system to use, to update the system to use latest rather than quarterly, and we'll do a few upgrades of the packages if there are any upgrades available. Anyway, that's the end of this video, and for now, the end of getting started with FreeBSD on the desktop. It's a bit more work to do it this way. You could use an off-the-shelf solution, say, for instance, GhostBSD or NomadBSD, and while they're fine OSs in, this, in their own right, they're tailored very much to the taste of the developers themselves. Now, if that doesn't bother you, fine, load one up, and that's what they're really meant for. But if you want to make FreeBSD something special to you, then doing it a manual way, doing it the old-fashioned way, uh, you can't beat it. There's a little bit more work involved, yes, and you'll probably learn something about the system as you do it as well. And you no doubt you'll probably mess it up too. But you know you get there, and you learn it, and it becomes almost like second nature in the end, really. You know, you know which files to tweak and which uh, things to allow, etc. And the result is a super stable operating system. Uh, it's as quick as anything that you're going to find anywhere else. And whilst this guide really can't go into every single nuance and detail uh, that someone may need, hopefully it's provided you with the bare bones, really, the, the skeleton in which to build your wonderful system. Anyway, thanks for watching, and I'll catch you next time.